Right, thank you to everyone for coming along to our session this afternoon. Um, we're delighted to have three um, excellent speakers for you on the theme of data-centric engineering. Uh, now, this, this theme is a term that many of you may not be familiar with, and so we thought it would be uh, a useful way to get started um, by inviting the, uh, the director of the Lloyds Turing Program on Data-Centric Engineering to give us a five-minute introduction as to what is data-centric engineering. So I'd like to introduce Mark Jerome from Imperial College London. So, um, thanks very much, Chris. So data-centric engineering, is this uh, a new role for the statistician, or is this just another bandwagon that's, that's rolling along? Uh, the argument I would make is that this is uh, not necessarily a new role, but uh, an existing role that is being extended all the more. Um, and one of the, the reasons for that is that the, the UK government uh, in 2014 were prompted by the chief scientific advisor to consider the age of data and to position itself as a country to be one of the, the, the world's leading uh, uh, countries in data science or in the age of big data. And so what came from that was the establishment of the Alan Turing Institute. The Alan Turing Institute is the UK's National Institute for Data Science. And five universities, along with the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council, established that in 2015, and operations started uh, in September 2016. Now, in addition to the, the institute being set up as the, the nation's data science institute, a number of partners, you can see some names here, the Lloyd's Register Foundation, GCHQ, the Ministry of Defence, some banks and some technology companies, um, invested in the institute and became partners or strategic partners. And one of those partners was the Lloyd Register Foundation. The Lloyd Register Foundation is the charity arm of the Lloyd Register group of, of companies. And its main objective is to protect life and property. And in 2015, they commissioned a, what's called foresight review on the age of big data and how it would impact the engineering professions and the engineering sciences. And what came out of this was that strategically, they should invest in establishing a program on data-centric engineering that would be based at the Alan Turing Institute. And I became, I, I was appointed as the first director uh, of this program in 2000, uh, well, the beginning of this year. Is it a role, a new role for statisticians? Well, of all the group leaders and strategic uh, leaders in the program, the majority of them are statisticians. And you'll hear three statisticians today who are part of this data-centric engineering program talking about some of the work that they are doing uh, in uh, data centric engineering. What you're seeing here is one project that we have which really outlines why statisticians are so important. We all know that statisticians are so incredibly important, but uh, even more so in, in engineering and in contemporary uh, new advances in engineering. Let me see if I can run this again. Um, You've all heard of additive manufacturing or 3D printing. So a company has now developed a technology which will allow them to 3D print a load-bearing structure, pedestrian bridge, across a waterway, and this will be um, installed in Amsterdam and will be used as a a monument, if you will, of civic pride uh, in regenerating various areas uh, in the city. 
the use of 3D printing or something like a bridge makes the potential of, of having a really beautiful structure which typically you would not be able to, to have using conventional construction techniques. The problem with this, of course, is that the material properties are not known. How to control the quality of those properties has not been determined. What the longitudinal uh, response of a structure that's been 3D printed will actually be um, with continual use is completely unknown. And so our group, the Data Centric Engineering Program from uh, Turing, have been brought in to characterize all of these unknowns in a sound, uh, consistent, uh, statistical way to ensure uh, the safety of, of life uh, and of property. In this case, this particular bridge. So I'm going to stop um, and just point you to the website for the, the program and I would encourage you to, to visit it. And if anyone is interested in actually uh, taking part, uh, do feel free to, to email me. And you'll also see uh, our uh, Twitter uh, hashtags there. Uh, hopefully, Katarina will be very busy tweeting uh, throughout this um, session. So I really don't have anything else to say, and I'll hand it back to, to those that, that do have something rather useful to say. So this is joint work done with Nicola Colombo, Sun Kang, and Eduardo Iroldi. So the main lesson I wanted to convey here is uh, this talk is most about transport engineering, mostly being more specific about modeling passenger behavior in a transport network. And of course, transport engineering has a long tradition, it's a well-established field. But at the same time, we see all these increasing uh, new sources of data that is available for them to be able to base their decisions on. I think one of the main roles of ourselves as statisticians is to be able to show to them how to make the most out of their data, which is not something which is, for example, traditionally part of the training of engineering. So this is one of the ways by which you see data centric engineering as a way of being able to communicate to engineers that they can still have much to learn on new ways of embracing and making use of new data. And data sometimes is there being used for a different purpose that is selling, uh, repurpose in a different um, direction. So one of the data sources I'm going to talk most here is, for instance, smart car data, which you might have seen initially introdu introduced as a way of facilitating payment, for instance. But of course, you can reuse this data in a different way, try to understand how your system works. So there's all the different ways of thinking which we, we believe statisticians out there to contribute to better practice of engineering. So my background, for example, I come from more of a machine learning background, and there I tend to think a lot in terms of predictive modeling. Not only have your data to create descriptive statistics or nice visualizations, but also be able to solve some prediction problems that might be of relevance. And here I'm going to introduce two pieces of work uh, which I contributed to. Uh, this just scratches the surface of things we can do with new advanced data science methods for and traffic engineering. So the two pieces of work I'm going to present here, basically divided in these two tasks I'm showing. The first task would be the, uh, the majority of this talk. It's about trying to estimate passenger behavior under some plane closures of a system like the longer underground. So for that, I'm going to rely on origin destination data. So there are different ways of measuring passenger behavior, of course, to make the problem more uh, focused. Here I'm going to uh, describe one particular way of measuring that, which is the number of exits that you observe in stations like in stations of the London Underground. And so every time you use a smart card, your Oyster card to tap out at a station, the London Underground, this is recorded. This is an exit event. This is how you're measuring passenger behavior here. So on plan closure here means parts of the system being shut down. So no particular train is navigating to sections of the system. Of course, you do have also planned closures. These are out of scope here. 
there are essentially situations you cannot foresee and then you have to understand what happens when such an event takes place. Okay? So I'm going to use Alone the Underground as a major case study, but essentially everything here applies to any system which has origin destination data. So you know, I believe here most of you are familiar with the Oyster Court, it records where you enter and you exit. Some systems are not like that, but for systems which have this particular type of data, everything that I described here about Alone Underground can be easily reused in a different setup. So the second test, which probably I don't have much time to go, in, go through, but I'll try to give you a flavor of what we have done, is to infer some unobserved passenger behavior. Because as you know, when you record your journey in the London Underground, you don't really tell which route you took. You, you cannot really tell immediately how much time you spend in different parts of your route. So you'd like to infer that for indirect uh, measurements. This is a type of route choice location inference that can also be done using the same type of data that you used for the first task. So there are many applications where this can be used to from the point of view of a transport authority like Transport for London. Uh, essentially, it boils down to two main uh, aspects, making a system efficient so that it runs to the maximum of its capacity and also resilient. So it is able to respond well when things don't go according to plan. So what I intend to see to show here are kind of initial steps towards a really fully data aware, fully automatized ways of being able to better manage the London underground, despite all the great effort that authorities like TFL put into making the system reliable. There's scope there to improve on that based on these new data sources that are becoming more and more valuable to engineers and statisticians. So to give an example on an approach. So here I'm going to detail the outline of this first problem that I mentioned to you. So the idea is we have a big system that has hundreds of stations. And to be more uh, precise here, I'm going to focus not only on the underground, but also combining that with the overground and the Docklands light rail system of London, which all have not identical, but similar ways of being used by passengers. So we build a model for all possible origin destination combinations there. We have around 100,000 pairs of possible origin destinations there. We are going to build a model that describes the usual behavior of passengers. So the usual times by which they start their journeys, by which they end, how long they take, how many people go from point A to point B. This is all basic information that can be modeled to a series of possible statistical approaches. But now assuming I'm able to model this natural behavior of passengers, that's when I can start asking some more challenging questions. So I'm interested in here, for example, when some disruption takes place and now passengers have to do something different. I can use the model that I originally built for this so-called natural behavior of the system to simulate what would have taken place had no disruption occurred can think of this as some sort of counterfactual quantity of for counterfactual quantification of people's behavior. So what would have happened if no disruption have taken place? This does tell me something about what will happen when a disruption takes place. So I'm going to infer these counterfactual trajectories of passengers as possible covariates, which I can use later on on a separate model that maps counterfactual behavior to the actual actions taken when a disruption occurred. So the whole outline, the whole uh, pipeline that you can see here on how this is going to take place can be described in terms of the data sources and the models that I've used in this task. So this is a very heterogeneous type of data analysis exercise because we have several different sources of data. So for instance, you have the smart car data the Oyster car that I mentioned, which I assume most of you are familiar with. You have also information about the topology of the network, of course, the different subsystems of the London Underground and so on. You also had access to disruption logs. So we do have annotated data from uh, staff at Transport for London indicating which parts of the system shut and when in which locations. And we also have some passenger route surveys that are used 
to give, provide some extra information on which particular trajectories users have chosen since this is not immediately available via the Oyster card records. So once you have this fourth source of data, some of them can be used, as I told you, to describe the natural way by which people choose their traject choose their origin destinations and so on. And I'm going to use this information as an input to a model that tells you or is going to predict to you what is going to take place if some parts of the system are not working anymore. So the actual Oyster card data you use is from the early 2011 for about a uh, year, a few days scattered over this year, 70 days in total. So it records location of entrance and exit of passengers, they also timestamps. Might have some measure and error, which I'm ignoring completely here. Some uh, passengers might not, not tap out when they leave because some stations don't have barriers. Sometimes the clocks in different devices might, not, might be miscalibrated, so the timestamps themselves might have some measurement error. I'm going to ignore that for the sake of making a, a relatively simple approach. And with this type of data, the type of questions I'm addressing are like those in this example I'm showing here. So this example gives essentially the main message of this first uh, task I'm dealing with. This is real data, this is from 2011. There's a sh uh, closure on Victoria Line, which is, if you know London well, if you know the Underground well, it's one of the oldest and busiest lines. So from the Victoria Station, which is located here, the Brixton Station is the end of the line. Everything they had to shut off at a very uh, busy time of the day, 5.30 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. I imagine the behavior of passengers is going to be different in this case. Among other reasons for that is whoever wants to get to Brixton will not be able to. So you might expect as a consequence of that, there might be severe changes on how many people are exiting Victoria Station. And the goal here is to predict that without ever having seen this before. So we have, might have seen other cases of disruptions. But this is a novel situation, a different part of the system, a different time of the day that you haven't seen before. You want to predict what's going to take place. So in this graph I'm going to show to you, uh, it shows a combination of what happened and what a model predicted. So you have here tap-outs, Oyster cards tap-outs at Victoria Station during the course of this day. So the gray lines there are the raw data. The blue line is the so-called natural regime model that I mentioned to you. So as you can see, it tracks the behavior uh, relatively well. And the period of disruption is around here between 5.30 and 7.30. So I'm leaving this gap open there to show here something different is going to take place. So this blue horizontal line here shows the average behavior if no disruption had taken place. So I'm not going to go to the trouble of modeling how it varies over this period. It's a bit too hard. I'm just going to say the average number of exits in Victoria Station had no disruption taking place. will be approximately what you see in this blue bar there. Now, what actually happened was a big increase on the number of passengers leaving Victoria per minute. This is the red line you see there. And this black bar that you see there is a prediction of a model that is out of sample. So I fit a model using historical disruption data to be able to predict that this will take place in that, if that disruption takes place at that time. So it's completely out of sample here, uh, this prediction on the volume of people leaving this station. So I'm not going to give any details on how the model works. I mean, there are papers which you can read which indicate to you where you can see the fully detailed description on how this is um, obtained. I'm just going to explain at a very high level the type of reasoning that leads to a model like this. So this is a stylized fact what would happen under disruption in a system like the London Underground. So this is a cartoon that basically says, if you have here a particular segment of the Underground which got shut off, so no trains can navigate through this, you might have observed some changes in the station, you might observe changes that subtract or, act or add to what would have happened under no disruption. So we have here uh, that you might have fewer passengers exiting the station 
because you're not able to reach it through this blocked part of the system. You might have an extra excess number of passengers that actually have to leave there because they cannot progress to other parts of the system. So this is still ice fact, of course, is not what exactly takes place, but inspires some models that uh, are, are able to come up with an uh, estimation of this outcome of interest, the number of exits and disruption. So to check this, I fit a model that gives you an estimated of the natural regime forecast, how many people would exit. And this is what actually takes place, how many people exit a particular station on disruption. You can see there's a clear linear relationship there. Of course, it's not a one-to-one -one relationship. And of course, I can add some extra covariates in that to reduce the variability or in the error in my prediction. So basically, the target of interest here is this average number of exits over the period in which the disruption took place. We use s covariates in a regression model, uh, discount of factor quantities that I mentioned, and also estimations, estimates of these flows that are based on a model that tells you which possible routes passengers are taking. So all of these are pieces of bigger models that are combined together, which results in a basic linear regression model with derived covariates. So in this case, I do have uh, the number of exits being given as a linear combination of the counterfactual number of exits, the so-called missing flow that I mentioned to you, and this missing outflow that is also estimated from the original model. Now, as I said, details are in a paper. I just want you to understand this is basically the main idea behind that. It's essentially a combination of off-the-shelf models with some basic assumptions on how they can be combined to provide these predictions. So this is such a large-scale model that does have, uh, might look daunting to begin with. So essentially fit here 100,000 models to specify particular origin destination um, behavior, over 100 million data points, which is the number of oyster cut tra uh, trajectories I had. This is still doable if you know exactly how to formulate which covariates are important or not. So even though it sounds like a very big model, it all fit within my own desktop machine to just know exactly which bits are important or not to include in a model. So to validate that, it did, uh, as I said, I did have disruption logs from TFL indicating which parts of the system were actually shut off. I can do in a situation like this is do fitting a model like that and assessing the predictive out of sample behavior of it using cross validation. So that's essentially what I did here. What this graph shows to me is just a comparison between this model that used these covariates and some other baseline models. So the other baseline models that are simpler, they take, in, for example, they throw away those flow covariates that I mentioned to you. They don't use that, they just use the counterfactuals of the exit counts. And what I show here is how much improvement I get in terms of reduction of absolute error on predicting the number of passengers per minute, uh, divided by different levels of how large the station is in terms of traffic. So the rightmost points here indicate uh, predictions in stations of high volume and the leftmost predictions in stations of low volume. And here, what I get in the y-axis is an improvement in reduction of error by using those flow variables. So <clears throat> here, for example, indicate a reduction error of six passengers per minute in a station which has about 80 passengers per minute uh, exiting in a normal regime. Okay, so reduction there by exploiting structure in the system. I know I do have very limited time to continue. I have two minutes left. So I just want to indicate one extra piece of work that you did that complements that. So as I mentioned to you, the idea is to infer some hidden structure of the system. We don't absorb the routes or the passengers. We do have those surveys which I used in the previous piece of work, 
uh, these surveys are uh, expensive to carry on, do have to have staff intervene passages and so on. It'd be good to understand rule choice in a more automated way using statistical models. And there is, of course, a classic literature on that called problems of network tomography. And here's an idea on how to extend this to a larger scale problem, because many of these models originally were not meant to very large scale um, systems. So you do have here, by the end of the day, something that gives you, for instance, an estimate of the loads of different parts of the London Underground at different times of the day, how many people are passing through it. Not going to explain the details because I do not, do not have time. I do have a reference for that that you can read later on. The take home message that I want to show to you is something a bit like this. We have here just a sample of possible stations, the underground, and you have some estimated loads on how many passengers are passing through this particular part of the underground at different times of the day. So this is of course not something you can validate directly, but the indirect measurements on uh, loads in different parts of the system. So the London Underground does have some ways of getting surrogate measures on how much volume is passing through particular locations in the system. So what I'm showing here is a correlation, the shape of these, these surrogates that are basically um, by the weight of the trains in the underground. So they measure the weight of the different cars in some trains. So this is a surrogate, how many people are passing through it. And this just showing to you there is some correspondence between the shape of these surrogates and the estimates that we have uh, on these approaches that use Oyster card to unveil the possible hidden trajectories of passengers. Okay, so this is just to give you a flavor of possibilities you can have an uh, out of data that was not originally designed to be used in an application like this. But as statisticians, we, we know how to make best, uh, best use of data. And this is the type of lesson you should pass to engineers when working together with them. So there are many opportunities for you what impacts there. There's a nice sandbox of possible questions that sometimes engineers don't even thought a reason to ask for. This is part of your job. Try to work with them on formulating questions. Uh, I do give these references. Of course, this talk is just a very brief summary of different approaches that I've worked on on transport modeling. Details really should be sought for in these references. And once again, I'd like to thank this opportunity of speaking here. Thank you very much. It's nice to be back here in Glasgow, giving a talk about my work, which is part of this program. Um, that being said, my project is not as far developed as Ricardo's is. Um, it's in its initial phases. So what I'm going to introduce to you to today in this presentation is really the problems that the engineers are facing, the data that we are encountering as part of this uh, instrumentation of infrastructure. And I'm going to do a very crude analysis of the data itself, but perhaps a revealing analysis. Something's hidden below the data, which you may not believe is there in the first place. Then along the way, I'm going to indicate potential research uh, avenues I'm going to explore in the near future. <coughs> So I'm working with instrumented infrastructure. The infrastructure I'm interested in are bridges. So I'm part of that 3D printed bridge project Mark was talking about earlier as well. I'm not talking about that, unfortunately. I'm talking about another bridge. So I'm working with engineers at Cambridge. Their unit is called the Cambridge Centre for Smart Infrastructure Construction. They've got this steel and concrete railway bridge. Here it is in the middle of Staffordshire. It's a real bridge, it's a real train, it's a real piece of infrastructure. It looks standard like any other railway bridge in the UK. However, what's special about this one was that the engineers, during the construction of this bridge, fitted this bridge with sensors. So we've got 130, approximately, <coughs> fiber optic sensors which are on the inside of this bridge. So now, the engineers are faced with the data that we are obtaining off this sensor network. So when I first started this collaboration with the Cambridge engineers, we asked them, what do you want from this collaboration, from this project? What's your wish list? So these Cambridge engineers are very clever people. They're even clever in terms of statistics as well. So I picked off three of their lines that they gave us. We worded it slightly, 
and these became the main objectives of the project. So what they wanted to do, and what's the aim of this uh, collaboration as well, is to develop methods to process, analyze, visualize, and assess the sensor network data. And they wanted to analyze data in the sense of improving the understanding about how a bridge behaves. So this is not just a bridge as a static object, but how it reacts when the train goes past as well. They also want to do some detection in terms of detecting statistically significant changes, or if you like, anomalies, in the bridge's behavior. So this could be short-term or long-term. So long-term is probably the one we're most interested in. Degradation of the materials over time. How can we do this, given now the new sensor data? So what is quite nice to see from the engineers themselves is that they realized that now that you've got instrumented infrastructure, you've got a sensor network providing data, it's changed the way that they assess and inspect their bridges. So the instrumentation of bridges or other infrastructure has changed the hands-on assessment of bridges' behavior to include a statistical data analysis. In one line, we're now assessing bridges' behavior through a sensor network or the data obtained through the sensor network. So from an engineering point of view, what they would do in the past is inspecting bridges, they would literally go to the bridge, they go and fill the bridge as well, they look at the bridge, they bring a little hammer, the banner inserts to check the degradation. I'm not saying we're going to replace that process of inspection, perhaps, but perhaps now through their sensor network data, we could do something less crude, and perhaps something more targeted. There's something wrong on this part of the girder. There's something wrong with bridge five, not bridge 10. So I'm not saying that we're going to replace or reinvent the way that engineers maintain and inspect their bridges, but we can actually do something <coughs> perhaps a bit more sophisticated. Just a word of caution before we proceed. Since we're working with the data through the sensor network, which is monitoring the bridge, we can never distinguish an anomaly if an anomaly is caused by the sensor network itself, the bridge, or both. We can merely flag when we say something's wrong. So let's talk about the data. Data-centric engineering. The data takes the central role. So, railway bridge, steel and concrete, 134 fiber optic sensors. These are located inside the bridge, as I mentioned before, but they're not equally spread out. They've got some in the girders. These are the main pieces of metal running along the bridge. And they're in the sleepers, so those are the concrete slabs you see underneath the railway track. What are they recording? Over time, it's wavelength. So imagine you've got this fiber optic cable. At certain points, you've got the sensors. They find a fire in a beam of light at a certain wavelength. When it bends downwards, the wavelength <coughs> changes. So what you really are measuring are vertical deflections. And the engineers love this because then they convert those measurements to strain measurements. How much of the data are we seeing? Well, every second we're seeing 250 data points per sensor. So you can understand that this potentially can be recast as a big data problem as well if we accumulate uh, uh, data over a long time period. So what I'm presenting here is just two sensor records for the same time. The y-axis here is the wavelength, measured in nanometers. And this is sensor 1 in one location of the bridge, and sensor 21, different location. These big events we see here and here is the same event as a train passing by, or at least, more precisely, the system or the sensor network feeling that train going by. So what I want to get across with these two pictures is that even though you've got the same bridge at the same time, we see different features coming across already. So prior to the train passing, we see that the noise, for example, in sensor 1 is a bit more varied or larger than that of sensor 21 as well. And of course, the feature of the train passing by is inverted for sensor 1 and 21, just by the sheer location of the sensor. So even though it's the same bridge, same train, we've got different features across the sensor network. And indeed, if I overlay not just two sensors, but 134 sensors and align them, it looks like this. So this is a mess. How do we deal with this problem? Or more precisely, how do we 
deal with this, these types of data. So this is, let's say, one train record that I have across the entire sensor network. And do something with that data for the engineers to monitor the bridge, to inspect the bridges. So this is where the statistics enters into the engineering problem. Right? That's the stochastic nature involved in this. So what we want to do is really capture the random nature across this sensor network in space and time. So across the 134 sensors over time as well. So there's no textbook way of handling these types of problems. So I proceeded as follows. First of all, I wanted to some some sort of statistical characterization of the bridge's structure when there was no load. So when there's no train, can I say something about the bridge in one go, in one characterization? Then I want to understand how this characterization changes when the bridge is under load, when the train passes by. Then I want to want to monitor the recovery of the bridge. So I'm going to talk about how I did this for some sort of simple statistical analysis of the data. Just something to bear in mind before you think about other methods to tackle this type of problem. What we really want ultimately is a quick and efficient method of achieving this. So as I mentioned, you're faced with these types of data. And no one tells you, the engineers not going to tell you which method or analysis you perform. So I went through a plethora of different techniques and methods. And one thing that was quite revealing was principal component analysis. So I'm sure most of you here know what principal component analysis is. Just want to give you a quick overview since I'm going to use it on the train data. So this is just a transformation of your data. It's orthogonal. It's linear. And it maps to a new coordinate system such that the first coordinate explains the greatest variation in your data. The second coordinate, orthogonal to the first, explains the second most variation in data, and so on and so forth. What's typically reported as part of a principal component analysis are the scores. So I'm going to say that the scores are S, it's going to be a matrix, and I'm going to have it equal to this data matrix X. So this is going to be a form of my data, my raw sensor data, where the rows correspond to time and the sensor readings across the uh, columns. Now the corresponding eigenvalue, eigenvector decomposition, which explains the greatest variation in the directions, is put into these, this matrix here, this W loadings matrix. So I put the eigenvectors in order in the columns in the in descending order of the eigenvalues magnitude. So if you don't understand that, all you need to understand is that the uh, scores are just a transformation of the data. Just a quick example to get this across. Imagine I don't have my sensor network. I just got this draw or samples from a bivariate normal distribution. This, the data looks like that. My principal components look like this. So we've got the largest principal component here, this longer line. And we've got orthogonal second principal component there. The scores would just be a transformation with respect to those axes. So bog standard undergraduate machine learning technique I'm going to be using. And I'm going to apply this to the train data. More precisely, I'm going to apply it to the train data when there's no load. So remember those time records? I'm going to cut out the events. I'm going to do that over the 134 sensors. I'm going to perform my transformation analysis, my principal component analysis. Then I'm going to show you a picture of the first two scores only. It turns out this explains the of variation. Does anyone have any idea what this should be or should look like? Apart from you guys. Except for Roger, really. And maybe Mark Weiss or somewhere. So let me give you the illusion of choice. Is it a banana? Is it a donut? Is it this free clover shape? Or is it sort of this nucleus, uh, a lot of um, uh, density at this nucleus at the centre? Which one? The top one's a bagel. Oh, bagel. Oh, sorry. The bottom one's a donut. 
Anyone want to say anything? Is it obvious what, which one it should be? Well, it turns out that it is actually the bagel then, but I'm going to call it a donut because that's what I put on the next slide. So I'll come on to my thinking as to why it's a donut later on. But let's think of the implications of this analysis first. So what I've done is taken the data over three 134 sensors over time and reduced it to a two-dimensional object, which is just a rotation, if you like, a projection of that data, that explains 42% of the variation in that data. The remaining 132 components explain very small amounts of the variation in data. So I've done my first slide. I wanted to say something about the characterization of the data under the load. And this is what I've done through this analysis, simple analysis. Or more damning way I've put this is that I've captured information over space and time and represented it as a 2D donut. So how does this help us and how more important does it help the engineer? So imagine doing the same thing again, but this time not on the full data set. In time, you batch it up into non-overlapping batches and perform PCA. I'm going to do it on batches of size 250. It's one second's worth of data. So you can see that at the top left, that second zero to one worth of data, I still got this underlying score donut. You see after 12, 13, 14 seconds, deformation. That's when the train hits. We have slight recovery to the circle, deformed again. Then we've got the recovery back to the donor afterwards. So of course, we could have done this with the raw data itself, right? We could see that the event was very strong. But now I can do this through a two-dimensional representation, much easier than having 134 sensors at once. But now I can also do something else, or I can now think about doing something else as well. So how can I just say something about the structural health of the bridge? Well, the current idea I'm having is to track these donuts over time to monitor the health of the bridge. I monitor the time taken to recovery back to the donut. Right, so if I go for a run, go for a jog, my heart rate increases. But it takes time to come back down to resting rate. Same idea, but the heart rate is now the donut. An increase in time taken to recovery may indicate something wrong with the bridge. Degradation, for example. The problem with PCA, probability, um, principal component analysis, is that it doesn't provide a probability model. There are other th variations we can use, so such, such as probabilistic PCA, factor analysis models. But now, after doing PCA, we know that these models contain well, we have a good indication that these models contain two latent variables. So I just want to finish off with talking about the donut a bit more. Because I said it was a donut, but really, why should it be a donut? Why is it not a ring, a disc, a bagel, whatever? So this is my understanding. It's completely wrong, but let's have a go. So forget the sensor data, the real data, and put it to one side for a moment. I'm going to drain the way to artificial data set. And now I'm only going to have two sensors. So sensor one is going to be generated by a sine wave with additive white noise. And then the same exactly the same for sensor two. But sensor two is at a phase shift of pi by two. If I throw that into principal component analysis, I get a donut. Anyone know why that is? So I don't know what this is. However, if we take a closer look at the data themselves, the actual true data, it looks like this. So I've, all, I've just taken up time off the bottom of the index. And you can't really see any signal in there. It's not really a sine wave. And even if you perform a Fourier decomposition, nothing strong comes out in terms of a powerful signal. So it's really unclear why that true data generates that stone. If anyone knows why, please. Do let me know after. So my, why I presented this is because from a physics point of view, it makes sense for me. So I understand that if I stand on this, any conversation people do that, if I bounce up or down, I'm going to force those in. I expect the vertical deflection to rip outwards, perhaps look like a sine of your shape. Right? And then because I've got one sensor here and one sensor here, it's going to be out of phase by something. So that was
was my idea behind using sinusoidal waves to generate a dome. But it turns out that that is not really represented in the actual data themselves. How much time do I have there? Oh, excellent. So there are some other things that I've done along the way, but I thought I'd just give you a flavor of the data themselves that we're dealing with and the ideas I'm having as how to tackle the engineering problems. So I just want to end by saying how I'm going to go forward with and without donuts. So I've explained that this donut is present in one bridge, one data. However, it's not just present in that one bridge. So I can, if I come up with a method to monitor this donut over time, it's going to be useful not just for one bridge, it's for multiple instrument bridges at once. What I want to do later on is monitor the latent 2D structure. So this may not be given by the donor, but say something else over time. And I'll explain how I'm going to monitor the health of the bridges. I want to investigate a bit more probabilistic PCA to look at a proper model and do all the nice statistical inference that I can do on these types of models. Moving away from donuts, um, another avenue that we're going to take is look at finite element models. So these actually capture the physical model of the bridge. So how one would expect waves to propagate through uh, beams of material of certain donut modules. However, the way that they calibrate these models is quite crude at the moment and doesn't use the uncertainty in their data to actually carry it through. So what we intend to do is actually combine FE models with statistical analysis slash models. In this presentation, I only presented sensor data. However, we've got much more than that. We've got video data and we've got temperature data as well. And the idea is that, well, can we just throw some sort of mach other machine learning algorithm at this, for example? So can we learn something about the number of carriages on the train and how the actual data sees this, the speed of the train? So that's it, that's what I have to say. I know I haven't given you much in terms of results, but hopefully some of you will have some ideas of how to tackle these problems. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for staying until the end of the session. So, similarly to Dean, I'm going to talk to you today about the project who just, which just started a couple of months ago at the Turing Institute, and is part is developing as part of our summer internship program. And uh, this is a collaboration with uh, the Remote Diagnostic Center in Siemens uh, in Lincolnshire. So just to keep expectations of everyone on track, this is really the tip of the iceberg. This is really the start, some initial insights, some initial ideas of how can we tackle this problem with the statistics. And what is the problem? Well, the problem is predict of predictive monitoring is to try to anticipate negative event for adverse events that can happen to the in a population. And this can be applied to many different areas. So for example, in medicine, you can think of patients that are in an ICU and we are monitoring them over time. And we want to predict when the patient will go into sepsis or into a more critical condition. The same we can do in engineering structures such as bridges, or in my case, uh, gas turbines. So basically what we have here is that we are going to observe sub this is not working, but, uh, we are going to observe surface in a population during a fixed period of time, and we are trying to predict when certain events will happen. So the structure that we are looking at today is gas turbine engines. So here you have a photo of a gas turbine engines. These engines, basically what they are doing is taking gas or certain fuel and through certain mechanical process producing energy at the end. So in practice, they can be used to power up a hospital or even a small tanker to generate electricity. And as most of the trades or all the trades in this session is part of data centric engineering collaboration with Siemens. But I just want to emphasize that this, while we are doing statistical research and we are building new models, the whole point of this is actually translating the models into actual outputs that can affect business decisions and all the models that we can develop is not only for these turbines. I mean, it's motivated by this, but it's a generic problem in itself. So why is it important to do predictive monitoring? Well, maybe it's very obvious, but if we monitor well the 
infrastructure, we can have a more efficient and we can have a safer system, but we can have a more efficient maintenance <coughs> schedule. So we can move from a more reactive maintenance where we only go and fix something when it's already broken and very badly. So we can have an engine, for example, that can be down for a long period of time because we don't have components to fix it. We can also have a scheduled maintenance where we go once a year, for example, and we do a checkup. However, if something happens in between, we might not detect it on time. But what we want to do now is something in between. We want to have predictive monitoring where over time we are trying to predict what is going to happen and react to that. So what is the type of data that we use for so we are going to do condition-based monitoring? The type of data comes from two parts. So if you are a doctor and you have patients, you are going to do some tests to record some quantitative information. These are sensors that are going to be located around the engine. So we can have things measuring, for example, the input fuel, the output energy, pressure inside the uh, temperature inside the engine, and so on. And this is very high frequent, well, not as high frequency in every bridge, but normally it's recorded every one minute in most of the engines. We also have like records. We also have doctors go and see the patients who they are, and they are going to record some information. And it's a more unstructured type of information where we are going to have maintenance records things that the monitoring system is recording, and the engineer also can go and say what is happening with the engine. And for this, we will have more irregular frequency, but they are going to provide us with a different type of information. So one big challenge is that all this type of data is recorded for the process of monitoring. So engineers and teams are actually monitoring the engines based on sensors that they have prior knowledge, that if, for example, the engine gets too hot, something is going on with the engine. But the data in itself is not created for what we need to create them. So there are challenges that I'm not going to talk about here, but there are challenges even how to access the data. So we have engines located all over the world. The way they access it and they put them together is a challenge in itself. And there are some groups in Oxford working on this project. And then there is also all the data branding <coughs> problem of actually converting all this unstructured information into something where statistics or mathematics can start doing that. So I'm going to go now at the preliminary stages of what we have been doing in terms of the statistical or mathematical modeling here. And I come from a background where I have worked on survival analysis before. So I thought, well, this is kind of a time for event prediction problem. And this is one approach that we are using for the problem, but we could think of something different. I'm sure some other people might have a different idea. So the problem I'm seeing is like this. So I will have these engines or subjects in my population, and over time, I'm going to record a series of events. So here, the, the green squares are going to record whenever the engine starts, we switch on, it starts working, and then, well, the engine will stop at some point, and this stop might be a normal stop, so someone just decides we don't need the energy anymore, we are going to charge it off, or it can fail, which are, are my, my um, red stars in this case. So actually, getting to this point, getting from the data that we have originally to this point is a challenging problem in itself, and Tim has been doing, has done this as part of the internship. So for example, the sensors are a very good indicator of when the engine is on and off. We can see it very clearly. If we just plot the speed of the engine, for example, we can see very clearly when it's on and when it's off. What is very challenging is to detect where, whenever the engine is finished, was at a normal stop or was a failure. For that, we need to go to the messages data and try to see from the records whether we have any records that uh, tell us that any given time point was a normal stop. For some of them, it's very trivial. So we just go and look at the time point and we see a message that says normal stop. But for some other cases, actually, this is a process that is much more manual. And it's because there are problems with data synchronization. Sometimes the sensors don't have the correct time stamp as well as messages. So, assuming that we can put the data in bright format, in terms of statistics, I'm going to think that my variable of interest is this random variable that is just measuring the time until failure for a certain engine here I'm going to go K, uh, and the I engine starts, so in the I run of the engine. So, just one thing to notice, it's traditional survival analysis, we have one event that happens, here we have that range of events. So, throughout the life of the engine, the engine might fail many times. So how we deal with this statistically? Well, I thought 
the most basic model that people use, one of the most basic models for recurrent events in a parametric setting is to say, well, all the events throughout the life of the engine are not independent. They are dependent. So we are going to, we could use, for example, some kind of fairly shared uh, share frequency model to model this dependency. And it's a very basic setup. So we are going to have the hazard function, which is just measuring the instant risk of failure for any given time point. And in this particular case, the risk of failure for all the failures or all the failures in a, for the same engine are going to be correlated and the random effect will have for the total distribution. Now the problem is that here we are not taking into account any degradation of the engine, so this doesn't really seem to be a reasonable model. But we can try to extend this by considering, well, we can take into account the previous history of the events of the engine in order to predict what is happening in this period. We can take into account what happened in all the periods before as a measure of how the engine has been integrating over time. So something that we can do is to alter this very simple model and add that the hazard function now is not only going to depend on the engine itself, it's also going to depend on the whole history of the previous events that have happened to the engine. So, well, we need to define how is going to be this dependency. A very simple thing would be to opt for a proportional hazard simplification where we are going to summarize the information that we have from the past insert there are some features that we use as reversals during this setting. And for these features, we have explored at the minute some things that from prior knowledge the engineers think might be relevant in this case. For example, how many times was the engine being turned off and on before? Because every time you turn on an engine and turn it off, you might degrade some of the components inside. We can also look at how much time it has been used for before. Again, if we use more the engine is going to be degrading, something is going to be happening inside. So if we, and we could extend this model also here, I have a common regression coefficient for my engines, I can actually see what happens if I try with different regression coefficients across the engines. So I went, I fit this model, and this is just the posterior distribution for the regression coefficient that I get for some of these features. And for example, I just will draw your attention to the middle one, so here we can see that it's certainly some heterogeneity. Some type of one model fits all engines. It's not going to fit all our engines. And in particular here, the feature was whether the previous whether the previous stop was a failure, yes or no. We're trying to use that as a predictor for the risk. You can see that for some failures, if the previous failure was sorry, if the previous stop was a failure, we see an increased risk. Now this might be a measure of that. Uh, the maintenance wasn't done very well, and we still have some degradation in the engine that has been fixed. Whereas in other cases, whether the previous failure, whether the previous stop was a failure, actually degraded the risk. I mean, because it failed, the engineers went, fixed the engine, and everything starts from zero. So we can see this heterogeneity in the effects that happen across the engine, and we are still exploring other features that might be relevant to this process. This is only some example of what could happen. But I told you at the beginning, I also have all these sensors. So I have all these sensors information that is longitudinal information. And of course, we are not going to be doing a very good uh, predictive uh, job if we are only looking at the past. We really need to look at what is happening now, the engine is expressing now at the engine itself. So we could try to incorporate this longitudinal information on our model. And there are tools in survival analysis to do this, like join models for longitudinal and survival outcomes, but basically what they are going to do is to extend the formula that we have for the hazard function and to add this as a function of the longitudinal information that we have. This is very common in survival analysis, I say. However, most of these models have been developed in situations where we have one longitudinal biomarker that we are measuring or a handful of them and then it's not going to work very well in very high dimensional settings where we have hundreds of sensors. We don't know which of them are actually predictive and also we don't know which features of the sensors might be actually predictive. Because we can think of, well, the engine getting hotter, having higher temperature within the end, it might be an indicator of the failure. So we are thinking of the absolute level of the sensors that we record might be informative of the failure. But also it could be things like the variance of the process has changed, we have increased variability 
in terms of the efficiency of the system, but also other things like correlation across the sensors. So I imagine that if I have multiple sensors that are measuring temperature within the engine and there is dust building up inside, it might be that the correlation across these sensors is skinny because the temperature is not homogeneously high. So we have a very high dimensional space that we need to explore in order to try to see what we incorporate here in the hub approach. So it's, this is some sort of feature selection. We have a very high space and we want to select some features that might be predicted to fail or not. So it might be very hard to do the selection in this type of a joint when we're doing our survival model, but we are very good or at least have some techniques to do this in a binary genetic control. So as a starting point, what we have done is to transform all this process into a binary prediction problem and just to see the behavior of the sensors before a failure versus the behavior of the sensors when the engine is acting normally and try to see if there is any predictive power. Can the sensors tell a bar like when the, in the period when the engine is failing versus not? So in practice what we have done is that we have transformed our data and we have said, well, whenever we have a stop, whether this is a normal stop or a failure, we are going to leave, first of all, an action period because it's not going to be very useful if I tell the engine is going to fail now. People cannot act. I need to give some action period. So we say it's like, well, let's look 15 minutes before. And then we are going to look at the behavior of the sensors during a, I think for the purpose of the results here, it's only 30 minutes before. So we are going to see if there is any behavior, 45 minutes before in this case, during the, those 30 minutes that can predict or can distinguish whether we have a failure or we didn't have a failure. So candidate features will be the sensors themselves, so the temperature, the pressure, and so on. But we also need to adjust these sensors by the demand, because every engine will have a different baseline, and it's not going to be the same if the engine is working at full load or it's working at half load. We are stressing the engine, and we can look at different properties of these sensors, because there are some problems on the data sometimes that the sensor might fail within a technique value, which is median, in the quartile range, skewness of the sensors in this range, correlation across the sensors, and so on. And here is just one example, and you can see that for some engines, so the blue one here is normal stop, the pink ones are failure. You can see for some engines there is a clear separation, for some engines there is a less clear separation. We went and applied just lasso, so one of the simple penalized methods, so logistic regression, but where we are using a penalized likelihood method in order to select some covariates that will be relevant, some covariates that have a non-zero effect. We selected some of them, and then in particular here we got an AUC of 0.8%, and here are the prediction scores that we get for normal stops of failures. You can see that there is some level of separation, it's not doing the best job that we can do. We can still, we still have like a very long tail here, so we have a lot of normal stops that we are going to end up classifying as failures, and then if we wanted to have a cutoff point, it's probably going to be very low, if we use the traditional at a point of 0.5 is not going to do it. But importantly before that is that within the features that we selected, it's not only we detect that there are lots of features like temperature and pressure and there are engineers in the past that have been using some of these features, but we also detect novel things like for example the skewness of some of these features or increasing variance of some of these features that are actually predicted before the failure not of the end. Now, if I look at the prediction scores across each of the engines that I'm analyzing, we can see that the prediction is, is not very uniform. So there are some engines where we do a better job, some engines where our model is not doing a very good job. So again, this is an indication that this one-size-fits-all type of modeling is not going to do the job here, because we have a lot of heterogeneity. We have a lot of factors that some of them are not recorded in our data about the different loads, for example, different, different engines are in different parts of the world, there is different like engines and temperature and different factors that might be affected. So what is next? We only have some insights, there is a lot of work to do at the minute. So some of the things that we need to resolve is there is a big data running bottleneck. I just show you results of five engines because there are the five engines for which we have good clean data at the minute. So we still need to see how to scale up things, and there, in particular, there are people at the Turing Institute working on that type of problem, so we are going to schematize them for the part. 
We still need to do the dynamic prediction. I haven't really done this any other prediction of predicting over time. We need to look at this. But at least we have a good starting point as of which features we should use to do this dynamic prediction. Well, something that I didn't go into detail is that we have failures over time, but these failures can be very deep. So an engine can fail because, for example, there is dust inside the engine and we might see that the temperature is going up, but the engine can fail also because there is a blade that is broken. Okay, there are very different failure types and these very different sensors might be reporting across all these failure types. Now, why we haven't done this yet is that in order to characterize these failure types, we need to do some natural language processing, perhaps, from this messages data in order to characterize different types of failures. Also, we need to think of any potential subpopulations of engines. So here we are looking at only five engines, but if we look at the whole fleet of the engines, we might be able to borrow information across some subsets of the engines, particularly for failure modes that can be read. So there might be some failure modes that we are only going to observe once or twice in some of the engines and we want to share the information. And finally, and very, very important, is that once we have our statistical modeling, once we have tested that everything is working with the data that we have, we need to actually go on site and validate that it works. Because although we can develop nice models, nice theory, the whole point of the project that I said before is that this makes, as Mark was saying, like infrastructure safer and improves the mental state. And just to finish, just some acknowledges, of course, to Siemens who have provided the data and lots of support throughout the project and to Tim who have done lots of this work. <laughs>